Hello everyone, my name is Colin and you are watching Classy Herbs. So uh, here today I'm going to try to do a video of something just a little bit weird. Um, so I'm going to cover all of the very unique kind of strange animals that you don't see very often on YouTube. Um, starting right here, this is a monkey-tailed skink or a Solomon Island skink. Um, these guys are the largest uh, species of skinks known. Uh, they're a very unique species because uh, they're the only member of their um, their whole uh, genus, I believe, and uh, they're just very, very strange animals. And the way that you see why they call them a monkey-tailed skink, you can see what he's trying to like. When when their tail touches something, it's prehensile, like a monkey's, obviously, um, and it, it just automatically wants to wrap. Uh, and so it does that that kind of motion of getting around things. And they just have this such. Uh, unique faces that uh, I just can't really get over just how blunted um, and and just prehistorical dinosaur look that face is. It's just a very, very unique animal. Um, I, I have never personally worked with any of them except for this one, and that was going to be a big point of this video of what I wanted to um, say to you guys is uh, one of my favorite favorite things about what I do here is just the fact that I get to work with so many animals. Um, there's just a constant flow of new things that are coming through the store um, that we have up here for sale. Obviously we, we produce a lot of things, we breed a lot of animals ourselves, but at the same time um, in order to provide that variety of uniqueness to our customers here, um, we order stuff in all the time. And so in doing so, every now and then, we, we like to place some really kind of weird orders. Um, and obviously these guys aren't cheap. Um, they're pretty expensive animals just because of the rarity. Um, and they're extremely difficult to breed in captivity, and they're not too easy to find in the wild either. Um, and they're not the easiest animals to take care of. Uh, they're completely herbivorous, so uh, they're not going to be eating any insects or anything. They're kind of picky about what they eat, so um, getting them established in captivity once you get them out of the wild is a little bit difficult. Um, this guy's going to get a lot bigger, um, not fully grown, but uh, very, very cool animals. Uh, honestly, like to be completely honest, I don't know nearly as much about this species as I wish I did. Um, something that I hope to uh, work with more in the future uh, and learn more about. But uh, as of right now, just to appreciate just how um, weird and unique that, that animal is compared to any other thing that I've really worked with here. Um, do you have any questions about it, Kurt? So do you know how big the, it, he will get? Uh, yeah, they, they can get pretty pretty decent size, like three feet or so with his body. Um, bigger than a blue tongue skink. That kind of puts that in perspective. Um, and and uh, kind of a unique thing about that is the blue tongue skinks being so large, uh, they're ground animals. Um, and you would think that something like that would have to stay on the ground, but these guys are fully arboreal. Um, obviously the monkey tail helps with that. And they've got some pretty pretty impressive claws on those toes there too to help them to grab into trees as they're going around and getting around in bark and plants and stuff. Um, but yeah, you guys find these hanging around in the, the treetops. Um, the Solomon Islands, sorry I forgot to mention that um, these guys are from the Solomon Islands, so kind of a weird little niche that they're from in the, in the wild there. Not a very big place, um, but Nonetheless, a very, very cool, fascinating animal. Okay, so here's another pretty unique animal that is, um, again, the only one of this species that I have ever personally worked with. And it's kind of disappointing because it didn't shed right now, and so it looks, and it's like full-blown shed. You can see his eyes right there. But um, normally it's a lot prettier than this. But this is actually a false water cobra. Um, you can see uh, here, um, and I'm sure you're going to see him do it, but they, they have a hood uh, that they mimic a cobra. Um, and it, it definitely looks very, very similar to a cobra. Um, but these guys are not cobras. Um, obviously, I'm free handling it. Um, but they are slightly venomous. Um, and so that's why I'm being a little bit timid kind of with his face right there. And I try not to piss him off too much. Um, but yeah, so these guys are rear fang venomous. Um, and it's a very, very mild venom in the way that they really only can... Um, use it to paralyze things that are very small, like frogs, uh, small fish, things like that. Um, 
And, and to even get that venom into their prey, they literally have to bite down and just chew, chomp on that uh, prey item because it is, uh, like I said, they're, they're rear fanged venomous. So it's not like a cobra or a rattlesnake that has those, those uh, huge fangs that are right in the front that are just going to sink into you on that first bite. Um, it's a lot harder for them to actually envenomate you. So if I was to get bit by this guy, there is a very good chance that it's a dry bite. And even if he did um, happen to get some venom into me, I might swell up a little bit, have a little bit of a uh, little bit of a shock. Um, but other than swelling up and getting a little bit red, um, not much is really going to happen to an animal as big as I am. I'm actually trying to kind of anger him right now to get that hood to come up. I know that sounds crazy, but he's being very calm for me. Um, they're a very active species, so um, they're usually all over the place, kind of like a garter snake would kind of, if you can imagine. Um, but this one's almost fully grown. They don't get too big, but um, not, not exactly like a small snake by any means. Uh, but uh, a very unique species that you don't see very often, um, just because it is kind of in that gray area of, is it really venomous? Is it, can it hurt you? Some people would say yes, some people would say no. Um, it is technically more venomous than a hognose snake, but uh, absolutely nowhere near anything like a diamondback or a copperhead. Um, so. Uh, kind of in that really gray area in between. So, nonetheless, a very fascinating species. Do you have uh, any questions? Yeah. yeah, I know you said it's a false water cobra, so do they hang out in the water at all? Yeah, yeah, they're a very aquatic species. You can kind of tell by looking at them maybe that they, they kind of have that uh, the scale type that would spend a lot of time in the water. They're like, kind of like waterproof, like a anaconda is. Um, kind of have that rubbery uh, texture to them, kind of that waxy coating. Um, so, yeah, these guys definitely spend a lot of time in the water. Um, uh, actually, I just pulled him out of his water bowl. He was just soaking in there. Not surprisingly, being in, he's in shed. Um, but Interesting fact about these guys. I only feed him um, mice here at the store, and uh, he always wraps up. He constricts his prey. So, um, to me, that, that kind of indicates that he's going to rely more on that. Even, even on things as small as a mouse, he knows that his venom... It's just not enough to even hunt a mouse with. He's gonna he's gonna have to constrict. So uh, not exactly something to be scared of. Kind of probably nodded himself up there. Any more questions? No. Cool. Okay, so this is the the last species that I'm gonna show you of kind of our weird animals here at the store. And you guys might recognize this one. It's probably the most um, most common out of the three animals that I've shown you today. But this is an Angolan python. Um, this is the closest related species to a ball python, and if you look at the head, I just really want to focus on the head there, doesn't that look just like a big ball python head? Like if you were to see just that head, you wouldn't really think anything that far off. But then you see the rest of the animal, and you're like, oh, obviously that's not a ball python. Um, they're way bigger, um, considerably larger, and they behave quite a bit differently too. You can see shoes just all over the place. Um, they, they really do kind of behave more like a reticulated python than a ball python. Um, very, very active, but not in the slightest aggressive. Um, they just want to go all over the place. Um, which is interesting because they're a very thick-bodied snake. So usually when you have this real girth, um, snakes like that aren't going to want to move around very much just because it takes a lot of energy to move a thick body around. But these guys um, don't really seem to care. Uh, this is a wild type Angolan python. Uh, there's really only wild types and albinos, um, and albinos are uh, extremely rare. But this is what they would look like if you were to find one in the wild. Um, and like I mentioned earlier, this is the closest related species to a ball python. Um, and so they come from an area pretty close, just a little bit um, south of there. So um, in a little bit drier place, so ball pythons are going to be more like savanna wooded area where they get decent rainfall um, to where they're going to have enough humidity to kind of survive and you, you know how ball pythons are um, but these guys definitely are more of a, a desert type species they don't do well um, if you provide them with as much humidity as you were if you were to like take care of it like a ball python they get scale rot a lot a lot easier um, they don't need the humidity to shed properly um, so they definitely uh, are a little bit different um, but they are still so closely related that um, they, it's like a, a donkey is to a horse in the way that uh, they're close enough that they can actually be bred, but they are different species. 
and uh, that's a very interesting topic. So this is my male Angolan python, if I didn't mention that other one was a female. Um, and one other really um, kind of key difference between the two species of ball pythons and Angolans is um, the sexual dimorphism that goes on between here. Um, obviously in ball pythons there is, um, there is some sexual dimorphism in the way that the females do get bigger than the males typically, but nowhere near the drastic difference between Angolan pythons. Um, you can see that female is easily three times this male size and they're the same age they're both mature several years old um, I've owned these for about two years now and they were adults when I acquired them so uh, to be completely honest I don't know exactly how old they are but they are fully mature um, he hasn't grown in a centimeter since I've gotten him and he loves to eat uh, so it's definitely not uh, that but um, she's obviously like way, way bigger than him, which is interesting. So there is a separation of the species, and they are different, but they are still similar enough to interbreed. Okay, so like I just said, um, they are still close enough to interbreed, and uh, that's a pretty interesting thing because um, not a whole lot of the times in reptiles are you able to do that. Uh, but ball pythons are typically uh, able to cross with a lot of things, and this is one of them. So this right here is what is uh, kind of nicknamed as an angry ball, um, which is just a 50-50 a hybrid of a ball python and an Angolan python. Um, and you can see that it looks like neither of the two species. Um, like I just showed you the Angolan pythons. Um, you probably all know what ball pythons look like. This really doesn't look like a ball python or an Angolan python. It looks pretty much exactly like you would imagine the hybrid to look, which is... No, not too surprising, but um, it's about the, the size that you would expect. Um, behaves very similar to a ball python, I would say, a little bit more ball python-ish than an Angolan python. Um, but, yeah, it's a very interesting thing. So this would basically be like a mule. Um, but, interestingly enough, it, it is not sterile. Uh, we have bred it um, two years now. Uh, we, we bred this hybrid to ball pythons, and we have actually produced um, some some babies out of it. So obviously this is not a sterile animal, um, which kind of throws into question whether the speciation has really fully happened between Angolan pythons and ball pythons, if their offspring is still fertile. Um, but, you know, that's not really it for this video. But um, just wanted to show you what the hybrid looked like and kind of uh, just it, what that does. So when you are, are trying to make a, a hybrid, what do you breed, like the male to a female ball python, or how do you? Um, it really doesn't matter a whole lot. You, yeah, you definitely kind of, you're going to be a little bit better if you take a male ball python and you breed it to your Angolan female, just because of the size difference there. Um, but it doesn't really matter. Um, I've done it both ways to produce these, and it doesn't seem to make any difference whether which gender you use on which species. Um, that is an interesting question, yeah. And you said these are kind of rare. Is there a reason why they're more rare yes, than ball yes. pythons? That's a really good question, yeah. So um, the area that ball pythons from, the, the laws around there and those countries um, are very unrestricted. So there's constant flow of new animals that are coming out of um, where ball pythons are from. Uh, but the, the areas that these guys are from are obviously a different country, and they have way different uh exportation laws so it, it's kind of like Australia in the way that nothing really comes in and nothing goes out unless it's smuggled illegally um, and so there very well could be um, just as many Angolan python morphs out there as there are ball python morphs but they're just they're not leaving the country that they're native to Angola anytime soon because uh, just of the laws of the land there and so we are left with animals that um, made it into the country before those laws were in place or were smuggled out. And it's a lot harder to smuggle um, a morphed animal than a normal animal, obviously. So that's why uh, just a standard Angolan python can sell for $500, you know, a wild type, while a normal ball python take a zero off of that. Um, so there's a pretty big difference there. Um, and then obviously, once you get them into captivity, breeding them is one thing. Um, there's just not nearly as many of them breeding in captivity. 
and uh, they lay very small clutches, surprisingly. Um, our female has laid four eggs for us when we've been breeding her. So even though you'd expect her to lay more because they're so big, they just lay these small little baby clutches. Um, so it is what it is. It's just kind of an obscure species to work with, but um, it's interesting. So just kind of continuing on the experimentation of what happens when you hybridize things, um, we thought it might be kind of interesting to take that hybrid ball python Angolan python that we had, the angry ball, and breed it back to a ball python um, so that we would get a two-thirds ball python, one-third Angolan python, um, and just kind of see what that looks like and go from there. So we bred that male that I just showed you to two separate um, normal ball python females, just complete normals. We just had them laying around and we were like, yeah, we can breed her, so we did. And um, we got two clutches, uh, absolute awful fertility, as I kind of expected, because, you know, it is a hybrid, and so things aren't going to genetically line up perfect, um, very bad in this one of these cases. So we had this one egg hatch. This is out of the first one, and uh, it was definitely, it came out very underdeveloped, like extremely underdeveloped, and um, just not healthy at all. But we have been force-feeding it pinkies, and it's actually about a month old now. So it's still alive, and I think it's going to make it at this point because it has been eating. Um, but it does look kind of like as you would expect it to look, like that two-thirds, uh, one-third combo. Kind of more ball python than Angolan python, which is kind of interesting. Um, we call it the slightly irritated ball. Um, kind of just playing off that name of the angry ball. Um, so that was clutch number one, and that was the only baby to have hatched out of that. So um, that was about a month ago, and then we had the other clutch just hatch last night. And to be completely honest, guys, I don't know how to make any sense of what I'm about to show you. Um, so I'm just going to show you and kind of talk about it. So uh, what happened over here, we had um, two babies come out, and uh, here's one of them. And keep in mind, they have the same father, the exact same father, different moms. The only difference is they're just different females, genetically the same, normal ball pythons. So the one over here that just came out looks just like a normal ball python. I wouldn't be able to tell that there's that his dad was half Angolan python at all, if he showed that to me. I would obviously be able to see something that was weird with this one, but, you know, they're brothers, and they look dramatically different. Um, to be completely honest, I have no idea why that happened. Um, and then to further on that, the sibling to this normal right here um, came out looking like this. So I'm kind of like nerd, like shaky right now, just because like I honestly don't know like what we're looking at. Um, so it's kind of exciting to me, um, because for example, this right here is from a separate clutch, and that's an albino ball python. Um, I know for sure that's an albino ball python, no question about it. That right there looks like an albino ball python, but is colored way differently. Uh, to me, it looks like a snow ball python, like an exanthic albino. But I promise you, the mother was a normal. Um, obviously, she had to be heterozygous, carrying the genes for something. And apparently, dad was too. Completely unaware of that. Um, so if anybody has any idea how something like this happened... Um, please leave a comment because I'm very interested and I'd love to have discussion with you guys. Um, unfortunately, it did get kinked. Just right on the tip of its tail is turned up. So uh, I don't think it'll ever breed, unfortunately, because it is it, it is a genetic anomaly. I'm not going to lie. This, this animal right here is just weird as it could be. Um, so... It's got a little bit of yolk that it's still absorbing on the bottom side there, but that'll have that dried up and off in a day or two. But other than that little tip of the tail, it seems to be developed completely, perfectly fine. Um, and you can obviously see the red-pink eyes. Uh, so, heavy indication of albino, but how that happened, I have no idea. So, um... Just thought that'd be something interesting to share with you guys. Um, always new stuff happening over here at Manhattan Reptile World. But thanks for watching. It's been Colin, Classy Herbs.